we'll look in a little bit more detail at how our daily verification feeds into the post event review management and how that uh, and, and other ways, you talked about qualitative and quantitative, uh, other ways that we produce more qualitative and quantitative information. So when thinking about what's an unconventional data source, I didn't actually find a definition anywhere. Uh, so this is my definition. <laughs> Television, radio and print. Um, the presentation that we had earlier on from Chile, thank you, talked a, a lot about the need for uh, observations to comply with international standards so we can trust the data. So I suppose when I think about unconventional data, I'm thinking about data that is still useful but doesn't comply with those international standards. And what we can pull out of the media I'm not sure about you, I'd be very surprised if you hadn't picked up the phone <laughs> in a busy event, spoken to a journalist who had information that was useful for you because they've heard about some kind of impact somewhere <laughs> which verifies your warning or your alert and instantly you're writing down in your logbook what you're being told and then you feed information back about the timing, certainty, um, and clearance of the, uh, the hazard that is occurring. So media is a huge and valuable source. Social media, we'll talk uh, a chunk about that and um, the, the sorts of information that we try and gather. We actually go through a bit of a process each day on the Extreme Weather Desk where we check the storm chasing Facebook sites and see you know, what's there on any given day. Um, most of the People working in the extreme weather desk uh, age somewhere between about 25 and 35. So they've all got Facebook accounts, they're all on Twitter, and, uh, and I've got neither of those, but they gather it and, uh, and, and do an excellent job of it. We're developing a storm spotter app. Uh, I'll talk more about that, but later, and it might be more uh, lunch or something like that, given, given the time. But having a, an app that people can feed information that is directly to us, that's aligned with the Bureau of Meteorology, we see as being a huge source of information for us. Unofficial online weather stations. So this is the... We're, we've got a partnership with the UK Met Office and as part of that partnership, we've got the, the WOW on, uh, website which allows online weather stations that people have purchased that they're willing to provide their data for and they can register on this website and all these dots are people's weather stations that are hooked up to the internet they keep them running 24 7 so in all those houses or most of them some of them go up and down depending on whether or not the power goes out or they turn off their computer or whatever but uh, particularly in some of the data sparse areas of Australia, it's really useful information, but it's not WMO compliant. It still tells us something, though. So, uh, and if it makes sense, given what you're expecting, then it's really uh, good information for validation. Transport data. Most of our cars have got temperature gauges in them now. I can't remember who I was asking, but the, whether or not... Uh, anyone's getting that information and using that, I'll be really interested in. We're not. But I think it's, again, more good information. Mobile phones provide information as well. Webcams. Remotely sensed information. So satellite, radar, lightning detection. How can that be used? I'll talk a little bit about that. OK. So, we covered a bit of this. I don't have to say too much. One to one and a half hours. The bit that I didn't cover, priority dependent. Our number one priority out of the three things that I talked about, top cover, surge and surge support, frontline communications and science to operations. You can guess what our top priority is. Surge support and top cover. So what's the number one thing that gets dropped off the duty list on the extreme weather desk? When we get busy, first thing that gets dropped is the verification. 
tears my heart out to say that because I think it's so important. But it's necessary. And the way we're structured, where we're producing development products, uh, means that we can drop everything if we have to. There's people starting to rely on those development products, but we make people damn certain and aware that if they're looking at these products, that they could drop out at any time if we need to provide surge support. So I talked about the Crisis Coordination Centre, Australian Government and Triple C. Uh, they're receiving the National Hazard Outlook, but they know that it could drop out at any time if we get really busy for an enterprise-wide event, etc. OK. We do a convective outlook. We're developing a, a product. We've been working on it for a couple of years now, it's, uh, and hopefully we'll see it go into the regions over the next year or two where we talk about the probability of thunder within 10 kilometres of a point. I'd be surprised if uh, you as operational meteorologists and, uh, and given the storm risk in this continent, don't look at a lot of the ways the Storm Prediction Centre in the National Weather Service operate. Our product is heavily based on what they do, but they talk about within 25 miles. So the chance of thunder within 25 miles. We went to 10 kilometres because that's what your area of responsibility for a TAF is. So we've all got that. It makes more sense. We asked the Storm Prediction Centre why they use 25 miles and that was the resolution <laughs> of, they think, that was the resolution of their guidance when they first started developing the products. Makes sense. So that's what they thought the skill was. Steve Weiss. Uh, legend of the Storm Prediction Centre recently retired, gave us that information. So we're also doing some fire weather conditional probability forecasts. We're looking at environments that are conducive to pyro... This isn't working. Cool. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Here now? No worries. <laughs> um, pyrocumulus. Uh, the Black Saturday fires, anyone who was here a couple of days ago, I talked about it a little bit back in 2009. Hundreds of fatalities, hundreds, probably thousands of houses lost, I'm quite certain, a couple of thousand houses lost. Uh, it was pyro CB that uh, created a lot of the uncertainty and unpredictability around the fire behaviour on that day. And it's really interesting, Pyro CB as well. So we're doing products around wind change for fire weather, uh, dry lightning, so lightning where you don't get rain with it that starts fires, and uh, Pyro CB. And these sort of development products and the National Hazard Outlook, if we don't verify and make an assessment of how reliable we are with the forecasts, then we're missing one of the four things for people to be able to make a decision about using our forecasts and give people a forecast, but if they don't know how good the forecast is, then it's hard to make a decision. So we do that by making a forecast assessment. The main thing we need to talk about today is the collection of the data and the reports, but we also assess the environment so for a severe thunderstorm, we've all got a pretty good understanding of what sort of environment's required for a supercell thunderstorm. We can forecast that environment, but we can also go back and look at whether or not that environment occurred if you don't get any reports and learn something from it. And remotely sensed information, so the satellite and the lightning detection, radar, etc. we talked a bit about before, and anything that the regions have heard about because they were the ones that picked up the phone and spoke to the journalists and heard about the tree branch through a truck window or something. So we gather all of that in one place and this is the sort of information that is in this product on a daily basis. So the social media, like this event was a random event that I picked out, 17th of November last year, uh, large Lots of photos of uh, large accumulations of small hail 
We actually had an event in Sydney like this uh, only about four or five days ago. Some of you might have seen that in the media. And uh, obviously an impact. You can't drive th fast through that. And, but we also get, got some reports of up to golf ball size hail near our capital in Canberra, southeast of New South Wales. We also had some reports of around three centimetre hail um, elsewhere. So having this as a structured part of the daily duties is really useful in so many areas of the Bureau. Our climate section are going to this product now when they start thinking about pulling together a lot of their reporting. I talked about how uh, it's the first place of call for post-event review management. One of my staff sent an email yesterday just tapping on the shoulders of the other staff saying, make sure you do this really well because I've just been through and had to do post-event review management on five events and, and it was only done well on a, on a couple of them, in which case it created a lot of extra work for her down the track. Really useful. This is the product that I was just talking about. So probability of thunder within 10 kilometres of point. We've got lightning overlaid to give an indication of where did the thunderstorms actually occur. And this is the probability of large hail. Conditional upon thunder within 10 kilometres of a point. So the way we've set these products up is that if you get a thunderstorm, what's the chance that you'll get large hail? And that means that if you've got 30% chance of a thunderstorm and 10% chance of large hail if you get a thunderstorm, then you've actually got 3% chance of getting large hail within 10 kilometres of a point. That's what we're having a go at. We need to verify that and make sure that it is reliable and so we can bias correct, etc. This was the forecast for the day and uh, there were multiple hail reports through it. We provide a national convective outlook discussion heavily based on Storm Prediction Centre. It is designed for severe weather meteorologists to read. We, talk, we don't say large cape, we don't say good cape, we say cape of 1,400 to 2,000 joules per kilogram. We learnt from the Storm Prediction Centre that you need to do these things because it's variant about what is good cape in one part of the country to the other. We talk about storm type or storm mode. Threat mostly, for er mostly early on in storm's life, in the clearer air where more robust updrafts could develop in the higher instability, before merging, growing upscale or lining out. This particular issue was done by one of my colleagues who goes to the States for about three months every year and risks his life chasing tornadoes around and he has huge amounts of passion and spends uh, a good chunk of his life reading Storm Prediction Centre mesoscale uh, discussions. So you can see the influence in there. Really good information if you're a regional forecaster in one of the states who's thinking about the convection for the afternoon, what the risk is and someone nationally who has, is building expertise through a daily verification process has thought about the same problem and, uh, it, it, and enables <laughs> merging and uh, better thought processes for their end products that they issue and their warning products. Okay, I've talked about the environment. The, this is an analysis. This is one of the Bureau run models. We actually got it from the UK Met Office, but we have, we run it on our own supercomputer and it is available at varying resolutions. We run a global model. This is the regional model, which is a 12 kilometre resolution. And we also have a five kilometre convective allowing model. And uh, all of these are being upgraded soon. The analysis run is useful to give us an indication of what the environment was like in that, I haven't got the overlay, but you remember that's where we were going for 10% chance of a storm if you had, 10% uh, chance of hail if you got a storm. So what did the analysis run of the model think of the environment? It's useful information. It's got a steep lapse rate just below the freezing level. It's got quite thick or fat cape, we tend to say, uh, through the hail growth zone. It's got cape 
in excess of 1,000 joules per kilogram. That's not capped. It's not a bad environment for large hail. So if you don't get a report because you forecast something out in the middle of nowhere, which happens a lot in Australia, <laughs> then going back and looking and thinking about whether or not the environment was conducive to the threat that you were forecasting is useful. Now, I won't go into detail about this table. The, I'll just give the bottom line. When you consider the environment, remotely sense information, uh, social media and all these other things for understanding how well you forecast a particular hazard, then just saying it was a good forecast doesn't cut it. The insurance industry or your business sector, they will be verifying your forecast for you. Well, that's what we're finding, which is great. Um, just be nice if they actually gave us what they were finding. But the, um, this method, we go through and we think about the remotely sensed data and our environmental assessment. We think about whether or not we got any ground-based observations or if it was just remotely sensed. We use the table to assess a number out of 10 and take the average out of 10. And, uh, and we also have, like I showed in the, um, uh, in the post event review management and the National Hazard Outlook, uh, like an Im uh, impact modifier. So if we forecast a marginal environment, so we're only going for a 5 to 10% chance if you get a storm, and the environment was assessed as being marginal, then we score that and give it a, a, an added weighting, or vice versa. So in this case, for that forecast, we gave it a 6 out of 10. Figure you can't have a 10 out of 10 for, a for, for uh, any forecast like this. So this is pretty good. By being able to provide a quantitative assessment of the forecast, then that reliability information is really useful. The data that is collected is hugely useful for databases. The actual um, verification, daily verification product still needs to go through processes to make it quantifiable. I don't know yet how to take all the social media information and, um, a, a, and say that because of that it was a 9 out of 10 forecast or an 8 out of 10. But we're working on it and looking at different processes to do that. In, and the reason why we've done a lot of this work is because we just do not get the reports, unlike what happens in uh, places like the continuous United States. Uh, but we can forecast particular environments that are hazardous because of the development work that has been done in the States because they do have those reports and that data. So we rely heavily on that as well. Okay. So it provides a quantitative record, provides that reliability information, which is so important for trust, credibility. Um, it's also useful for now casting. If you're doing it quick enough, like it sounds like the Chile Met Office is doing, really useful if you're forecasting a threat. As soon as you get a validation of that threat, it gives you greater confidence in your cell-based thunderstorm warning or whatever. Helps correct forecast bias. Oh, the model performance. By going through and looking at the environment forecast by your guidance compared to the environment that you have assessed, straight away um, has you on the phone, we found, to our model developers saying, how come X or Y? We found that our model was producing uh, a lot more mid-level moisture than what the ECMWF was and therefore the mid-level instability was being picked better by our model than the ECMWF. And so we started bias correcting the ECMWF because we believe the ECMWF's uh, low-level moisture or boundary moisture better than we believed our model and you start combining the two sources of information from the bias that you understand about the model to improve your forecast. Really useful for forecasting, really useful feedback for the model developers. And uh, allows you to review the techniques 
and thought processes. Feeds into the pace event review management. That's the, the bottom line, really, that we're here to talk about. So, how are we going for time? Ten minutes? Okay. Let's do PERM in ten minutes. What type of events? We've already done this one. So that's easy to skip through. The big events. The benefits. I think we've pretty much spoken to most of those already. Validates the NHO, and prov provides a database. And it's part of what this session is all about. Let's have a look at another event. This one, what, this event occurred as we were developing the post event review management process. And it resulted in the whole state of South Australia having no power. And that was a pretty big impact, you could say. So we had a deep low pressure system, it was a bomb, dropped more than 24 hectopascals in 24 hours. And uh, there was a front associated with it and a good source of tropical moisture feeding into it. We got some massive waves off the coast. We got five centimetre hail associated with it and multiple tornadoes. It was a tornado outbreak. Yeah, just a, just a chuck in the mix. <laughs> uh, on the left is satellite info. Uh, sorry, radar info of the uh, the storms moving through the uh, the the. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll move across. This is this is better. Um, the uh, you'll see some cells moving anomalous to the flow, i.e. the supercells in that, and uh, there's an image of the, of the system the next day as it brought that surge in through South Australia, so it got. South Australia got whacked by the front and the storms on one day with the tornadoes and then had this surge of southwesterly um, gale force winds moving through. There was some danger to life. We collect some social media in the daily verification. It allows us to say that there's widespread damage to building and structures quite confidently. This is the forecast of the chance of a tornado if you get a thunderstorm. And it was a 5% chance. If you get a thunderstorm, the assessment of the environment 36 hours ahead of the event was that there's 5% chance of a tornado if you got a thunderstorm. The red dots are where we recorded, uh, where we know of tornadoes. It's likely, given the environmental, the environmental assessment, that there was tornadoes further north as well. I'm biased, I did the forecast, so the, uh, the assessment which I went through might be assessed differently to you, but um, it was a, a, a big event, but it was also one of those textbook events. I think most of us who've been in operational meteorology understand the difference between something that's really obvious and we know the environment and we can be quite confident versus the marginal, will the cat break or will it not, that sort of thing. Um, Tornadoes and squall lines took out the power lines. There was a bunch of other things that occurred, which meant the whole network went down for South Australia. Uh, agriculture, there was flooding, and um, so that created quite a lot of damage to market gardens. Um, widespread tree damage, as you expect, if tornadoes, etc. It hit Adelaide, it hit all the major population centres of South Eastern South Australia. Uh, so ticks there for the extreme. The spatial exposure, it was widespread, really affected you know, a good 80% of the state. And it lasted more than 24 hours because of what I said, you had the front with the storms one day and then you had the surge as the bombing low hit the coast the next. So. It got a 29, going through and adding all those up. So we can go through a structured process and provide a quantity at the end of it that we can verify against the forecast. Uh, just before this event, my, 
I'm lucky enough to have a science support officer in the Extreme Weather Desk, and his name's Dean Scarbossa. Uh, would not surprise me in the least if you, that name becomes better known to you all in the coming years. He produced this map, which is the probability of thunder um, for the forecast, but it also shows underneath all the, all the dots is where we have our population. So it becomes fairly clear end game sort of things with impact forecasting. You take the forecast, you put the exposure information underneath it and uh, very quickly you can start getting exposure reports of, of people who are under threat. Um, I apologise, I can't remember which country presented uh, something along those lines yesterday, but um, it's great to see that already occurring. have impact modifiers in the post-event review process to consider as well. And there had been previous flooding in South, uh, Tasmania, but also in parts of Victoria and New South Wales. And we had assessed for this event that there had been a recent impact. And so the community resilience was reduced in their ability to prepare for this event. The travel periods, we had a public holiday. Do I hear anyone thinking this is the perfect storm and anyone want to pull that out? We didn't, thankfully. But um, it's one of those ones where all the, li all the ducks lined up for a big impact. And that resulted in us assessing this as a 33. Now we did this as part of the development process of PERM, but interesting to go through. Uh, you can go through and clearly you can imagine with an event like this we had an extreme low end, 10, extreme impact for our operational work as well. And we've already seen the PERM process chart. So I think I've probably nailed the 10 minutes that I had. And I'll leave it to Carolina as to whether or not we have a question. No. <laughs> uh, 